I'll call the meeting to order. This is the April 1st meeting of the Economic Community Develop Development Housing and Land Use. Um, and all members are present. <coughs> this, this meeting will be audio and video recorded. We'll start off with public comment. Is there any public comment? Mr. Winston? Uh, thank you. Go Swamis. Uh, so I understand that there might be some discussion about a proposal regarding um, zip cars coming into the city uh, in terms of parking and where they would be parking. And, and first of all, um, if there was any arrangement with the company that owns the zip, park, the zip cars, uh, I, I can't see any scenario where they would be granted any type of, of free parking in the city. I mean, everybody in the city pays for parking. The, the monthly holders, we pay $90 a month. If you park in the garage, um, you pay, even if you're not a monthly holder. Uh, I can't, as I said, see any set of circumstances why there'd be any benefit to, to offering them any type of, of uh, concession on the parking. In terms of the actual structure of, of the parking in the garage, there's very limited, the monthly parking holders, if you have a monthly uh, pass like I do, in the lower part, there's, uh, during the week, it's, it's full. And, um, and, and then you have to try to get the zoom in the rest of the garage. So if there was eventually parking for the zip cars, and again, uh, they should be paying, uh, I would encourage the city not to give them passes. In fact, I, I think that there should be a hard look at this, whether there should be um, now a, um, a prohibition, actually, against giving any more monthly pass holders, given that there's way more people that have the passes, leaseholders, than there are actually uh, lease spaces in the lower garage. And uh, if the zip company did purchase parking, I would encourage the city to give them parking that did, uh, or arrange a payment plan for them that did not include parking uh, in the lower part of the garage. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Uh, next, we move to the approval of minutes of the March 4th meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Just a second. Is there any discussion on the minutes? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 3 to 1, 1 abstention. Uh, we're going to now recess for a meeting with the ad hoc roundhouse lot development advisory committee. Uh, and we're going to discuss the development of the round, roundhouse lot. So uh, if, the, if the, the members of the ad hoc committee could, could join us up here.
we could go around and say who we are. Julie Cowan, I'm the Chief Development Officer at Park Schools for Hearing and Speech. I'm a Ward 4 resident, and I've only lived here for 20 years. <laughs> I'm Ryan McDonald, I'm the Ward 3 City Council. Jesse Adams, LR City Council. Mary Casper, I'm the uh, former Executive Assistant to Mayor Mary Ford, and I'm the co-coordinator of the North Capital Lawrence Council. And I'm retired, and I live in Florence. Paul Spector, Ward 2 City Council. Gina Lodishar, Ward 4 City Council. And Brooks Planning Board. I'm Kevin Lay, uh, liaison from the Conservation Commission. <coughs> okay, so shall we open up with a discussion of the, of the report from UTIL, which I assume everybody's read. Um, also, when you speak, would you, would you say whether you went to the public meeting or not, just so that we have a sense of, of how conversant you are? On you. Anybody like to start? Well, I think I, I was not at the public meeting, but I think there were two meetings when UTL has presented pretty much the same thing and took questions. But what would interest me, I've heard, but I think it would be helpful to kind of recap what were some of the challenges or things that people, when, when UTL made a presentation, what were some of the things that people were saying, we need to take a look at that? That would be helpful to know. I've heard things, but not kind of recap them together. Okay. Um, does anybody want to take this on, or do you want me to talk about it a bit? I was at the community meeting, and I was at the UTO meeting, and I took some notes. Uh, I think, in general, people liked the idea of housing, opposed to uh, anything else that would go there. Office space was the other one that was looked at. The real, the most telling question, I think, came from people about why is parking driving this project? And that came up a number of times, and that still remains an issue. Um, I think it was Owen Freeman Daniels who said, well, city council could change that if they wanted to. So I guess I would ask uh, how people feel about this parking issue, since it did really define what could happen in the parking council. That was kind of one of the main issues that people brought up. Um, there was another issue about connecting the Pulaski Park with the project, how would those work? And I know that it's come up again at city council meeting brought forward by former Councilor Volkman. Uh, so that's another thing that would be good to discuss. The, um, there was also, I think, a consensus that this was a good first step, but it was only the beginning of a process and that there should be continual community involvement in the process. So I'd like to throw that over. Um, before we discuss how we feel about it, I'd like to hear a little more, if the mayor would like to hear why and if parking is driving. I'd like to hear what, what is there that, that initial RFP either seemed to be to a lot of people that it was. And I'd like to hear that and then I'll discuss it. Um, it's actually driven not by the RFP, but by the, when the city council voted in 2005 to surplus the property. Um, there was a council order drafted, and the two of the provisos that were in the now therefore be it ordered was one that the mayor needed to um, any sale had to be done in consultation with the council's end of the committee. Um, that was one, um, which is why we're all gathered here. Uh, and two, it was um, had could not basically had to replace parking. That there could be no net loss of parking. Um, in this municipal parking lot. So that, that you know, and I think the folks from Teal were pretty upfront that they they weren't actually kind of happy with that as a starting point. It's not where they would start their normal process, but that, those were the parameters as, as were defined. So a lot of what they do in the report is driven by this calculation about we have to start by replacing X number of parking spots. So all the little proposed structures they propose has to first accommodate the replacement parking and then provide parking for whatever it is that's being proposed. So, um, but but certainly that could be changed. Right. Yeah. It, if I do, remember, I was on Edlu then, and I yeah. can't quite remember the arguments, which is why maybe Wayne could fill us in. 
it seemed at the time, because I think unanimously Ed Lou also voted no net loss of parking at the time. Um, and I guess I'd like to hear, because I, I, I was on Ed Lou, so I voted for that. I was on the council. I think we voted unanimously. Was the council also voted unanimously no loss? So it was presented in a way that I think it was a, some compelling arguments. Those may have changed. The council may change that. But I'd like to hear what those were at the time, and do those still exist? And I. I actually wasn't on the city council. So uh, I will. Uh, but just briefly, I think it's a perception of business community that I would probably agree with. There's not enough parking downtown. The vote in city council, if I had the timing right, was after we had done, or after we got Bay State Gas to clean up. Yes. And so businesses downtown felt like, what, what was the loss of losing this parking lot for a year? And they felt it was a real parking um, So I think it was a concern of losing the spots. That said, I think if we were reinventing the city and starting all over again, this is not the most important place for parking. We had VHB do a parking study that's now 10 years ago. They thought the shortage was basically way down the other corner of town, the north side of Main Street. So if spaces were replaced somewhere else, I don't think they go up this spot, but that was the history. Another consideration that factored into how UTO presented the options, initial options were that the agreement with the roundhouse lot requires that the city provide 22 spots. So that dictates to a certain extent how the this surplus uh, lot could be reconfigured. There another consideration was that whatever the plan is, that it should be, should be something that could be integrated with the public private partnership of the lot and a vision for Pulaski Park, even that they are neighboring. So that was another consideration that was repeated throughout the evening uh, for the people that were speaking of the potential use of the property. I think one of the other things was um, the connection to the bike, to the rail trail, and the, the way the stairs come up, how to integrate that better into Pulaski Park and how to integrate it into the project itself. Um, there was a good deal of discussion about the Mill River and how it works, and there were some ideas thrown out about changing the project altogether and highlighting the Mill River in a different way. There were talks about expanding Pulaski Park into this um, project, moving the buildings back further. Um, there was a question about tax revenue, what the advantage was to the town, and there was really very little discussion about commercial property, if I remember correctly. Um, there was a sense about there should be community involvement and community benefit with the project, uh, however that gets defined. Um, did anybody think of anything else that was discussed? It was a consideration as well, recognizing that for the limited footprint that the space provides, that the highest and best use of the property in itself is hampered by the requirement of the replacement parking be net zero as well as the commitment to roundhouse. So that, at the get-go, creates not a more hyper situation, but it does prevent, uh, present challenges that a developer normally wouldn't uh, have at the start of the project. Yeah, and that's certainly reflected in the executive summary of this. Yes. I, mean, I, I think I attended this meeting. Um, one of the issues with commercial that more, just simply more parking is required. That was for the office space. For yes. office space. <coughs> so that's, that's just kind of not even feasible. Because of the amount of parking. Well, one of the challenges that they were talking about was that the cost of construction to accommodate the, pro the parking needs would make it potentially cost prohibitive to a developer. So that's where the public partnership, uh, public private partnership, or whether it be quasi public or not, uh, was something that was discussed. Ms. Collins, last, that, that point is, uh, uh, I think, well, it's a concern that I should, I think, a major concern. I think that maybe where we should start thinking, you know, start because if, if it's cost prohibitive, uh, if it, to, to develop their, with that requirement, and that's, that is a requirement, well, I, mean, I think we may need to really talk early on about tackling them. 
Um, I'd like to bring up something that pertains to that, which is the toxicity of the site. That that's an underlying issue that, to my mind, has never really been resolved. I don't think we have a sign off on this. Can you mention that? Yeah, and I, and I was actually going to, one of the things I was going to suggest um, at, at one of your next meetings was to try to have someone from have a presentation for you on that issue, because I know that was one of the concerns I had when I started hearing that we should um, you know, dig, dig, unearth the Mill River, and because and, there, there is an issue of, um, the site is a the site is a 21E site, um, and we have been working with Columbia Gas um, over the last several years. Uh, they are, um, you know, they obviously did a bunch of cleanup um, they are still working not only with the city, but they're trying to work with a number of property owners, Northampton Housing Authority, and there's private property owners um, to reach um, sort of, uh, I don't want to say close out, but to sort of reach closure on those particular properties with regard to what the, what the future uses can be. Um, right now, there's a, what's called a a temporary Class C status for the entire site. And the site in question extends not only out here, it actually crosses the street and goes over into the other you know, parking lot um, across from the brewery. It's a fairly large site. Um, and so and, uh, there's actually going to be some, some regulatory changes that are supposed to be happening this spring that may impact that closeout. But we've been in conversations with Columbia Gas about trying to reach some kind of an agreement around um, how we can close out the site, at least for purposes of delineating what could be built there in the future. Um, what typically happens is um, uh, use limitation restrictions get placed on a site as part of this agreement process between the owner and the affected party, um, or the former owner and the affected party. and so. Those are things like, you know, you won't build a, you know, a, a daycare center, or you won't build this, or you won't build that. The kinds of things that happen at gas stations and other former sites like this. So there's still some uncertainty around that, um, but it might be useful to have, um, for me to try to get someone from DEP to come in and do a presentation for the committee who may not remember back when we were doing that whole project, and they can kind of show a map of what's been delineated. Um, and so, and that also I think is important for people to understand um, in terms of what the options are for the site. Uh, my goal has been, you know, this process has been working its way, um, and we've been on this parallel track in conversations with Columbia Gas and DEP, because my goal would be to have the site, at least have the site delineated in a way that anybody who was thinking about doing something on it would have a clear understanding of what they were getting themselves into and what any potential costs might be. Um, and also, particularly if there's costs above and beyond the normal cost, what responsibilities Columbia Gas may have as well, which is a key issue. Um, they obviously don't want to minimize their future costs. Uh, and we are trying to have some clarity around that because it's, I mean, that's been the other challenge at the site is who's going to buy it sort of not understanding what they may be getting into, what's underground. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's what that's where that stands. Because I know uh, Tim Love said at the community meeting when asked, someone asked in the audience asking that question, that you could really only put a parking garage on it. And, and in an earlier discussion, he mentioned you could only put three foot deep pilings on it. So if, we, if somebody comes from Columbia Gas, that would really be mm -hmm. significant information. If we could yeah. Get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so I can work on, on trying to have that happen for a future meeting. Um, I think what may have been stated is the site, most of the parking lot area itself has been cleaned up um, to three feet. Uh, clean, clean soil has been brought in. There's a membrane at the three foot level. Um, and obviously it's paved, don't paved back over as a parking lot. Uh, it's if you were to then think about doing something more significant that pierce that membrane, and then you can start to get into all the other issues. Um, so, uh, and that was a, something that was happening. The, the former hotel developer was in negotiations with Columbia Gas around their construction project and who would be responsible for what, et cetera, because they needed to go 
deeper to put whatever. You know, presumably for a parking structure or a parking structure that's going to support a building, you're probably going to go, you go, you know, the frost line's four feet, right? <laughs> so you're going to have to go, you're going to have to go down a, a little deeper. So, um, so yeah, that is one of the lingering issues that I think has to inform um, whatever RFP goes out. Um, and that's also my concern just about <coughs> Uh, you know the whole issues around the mill, the former Mill River, and what's what it is now today, and and what could be if there could be alterations there. So, thank you. So we, we can definitely work on trying to get someone for a future meeting to come in and do kind of a, a good overview presentation. Okay. So Jesse, would you like to discuss the public-private partnership concerns you have? Well, well, uh, uh, the only thing, the concern I have is just that. What was already reflected was that um, <coughs> replacing the apartment as mandated um, might be cost prohibitive. So, so that that point was already addressed. Um, but you know, so it sounds to me like maybe the two starting points, and even you know, before that, might might really, might really want to consider the toxicity issue um, initially before that, and then maybe we should we should um, try to address the point about. Um, place of parking and the potential cost prohibitiveness of it because it seems to me like we can't really sufficiently address those two things and I don't know really, where we can really go. Mary, I don't recall uh, at the utility meeting if they uh, addressed whether, um, in terms of the parking issue, um, is uh, net zero, which means you got to replace all the current parking plus whatever additional usage gets generated by the design. Um, if that were uh, only reduced to uh, yeah, replace current parking, but uh, is there any opinion that they had about how much impact the Jesse's concerned that this might? Is there some space in between um, zero and whatever it happens to ideally make? Is, is there some limit that could be in between? Did they address that? Or? I don't. I don't remember if they addressed that. I don't think they did address it. I think he, he took it as a given because that was the way the um, the thing came down from council that we had to have that certain number of parking spaces. Certainly, the current parking, the roundhouse. I think it's name is current, isn't it? Mr. Yes. Curry, Mr. Um, that was a legal, legally binding yeah. disposition. That was a legal settlement. That was a legal settlement. Yeah. So those are up to 22 or 28. And he has those, I mean, he has those spots right now. Um, obviously, that could change. They're on this property, and that could change if you were to change the property. I just I wanted to add one more piece of information, which I think is, is relevant, which is, since the 2005 city council order, the city has changed its zoning. Um, and so in central business, you're no longer required, there is no parking um, requirement in the downtown central business district. So if you open a business or do, or you know, convert a building, you're now no longer required to provide you know, so many spaces per square foot, per employee, et cetera. And I think the thinking was that we didn't want people tearing down buildings to build parking lots. Um, so in the central core. So that, that is a change. Um, so like, you know, trying to take extrapolate your thought, what formula would you use to say, this is how many spots you need? Well, actually using the zoning, there is no formula because you're not required to. But of the 22 is I have two questions. One is how many spaces are there currently? And so how many, and, and the 22 are locked in. And the other question is, I don't feel like I have, I would need help from planning or somebody mm -hmm. to say, let's look at the, how many parking spaces from a planning perspective should be there. So I'd kind of like, whether the, whatever the council said, I don't care at this point, it can get changed, but I'd like to know what are we looking at? 182, what is, what, 182 is what they used as a as the one, I'm sorry, 182. That's what the report. And 22 what, are locked in definitely. Yeah, that's what they yeah. used as their starting point was 182, um, and that was uh, and they were even reconfiguring our parking lot a little bit as well in the process because they thought we could actually put more spaces in if we needed to. So they were using 182 as the starting point. So. So, I mean, if we're going to go back to this discussion, which I think is important, I'd like to start at the kind of beginning where you look at this and say, okay, from a planning perspective, what kind of parking are we going to need back there? 
if we have apartment buildings. I mean, we could always ask Util to do this, but we could always pay for that. We could deal more than keeping Wade and Carolyn up late. But at least like a first hit before we would ask Util to go back, because that's that probably be a pretty that's a pretty big thing when you take that away. That opens up this whole thing for all kinds of other possibilities, which may be where we go. But at least initially, I'd kind of like to hear kind of internally what from planning, and I'm not saying we need to do this today, but what are we looking at back here which would make sense? Do we need to have those 182? Could be, what would be the low end of that number? Don't you want to know where you might, elsewhere you might have them? Yeah, I, that, that's right. So, so kind of, so it has to be a more comprehensive look at, you know, if we take away the parking, are there other places for it to be? Is, is does that make any sense? So, um, well, I believe it depends on the use. I mean, central, right. central business clearly, if the desire is to have business space, office space, which was not the general consensus of the, yes. of the crowd, um, then then we don't have an issue with parking so much. But if we go down the mixed use or residential predominant residential use, then there is the need to address parking, correct, for residential spaces. So and then, then it becomes a matter of what's the space itself, you know, for the, to bring it up and up to the grade with Pulaski Park, to bring it straight with Main Street, you've got some basement condominiums, if you will, or, or apartments rather than garage spaces or, or even just parking. So then it becomes, is the space really desirable? Is the, the, the building that you can fit into the space will keeping, with keeping the parking at minimum, is that something that really is going to be a desirable residence for anybody? <coughs> now that, that's the conundrum. Yeah, and, and also there's the environmental piece, which you're going to hear about, because there'd have to be some vapor control systems, and you'd have there'd be some other issues. And I, I don't, I can't tell you with surety whether they would even whether they're going to sign an agreement that allows first floor residential um, in the in the site. That we're not at that phase yet. I was going to point out to the parking piece, and this is sort of a larger discussion that we're in the middle of. Is we are looking at a. Um, Trying to uh, trying to do a, a larger parking study of the city and the city's parking capacity, um, and uh, we kind of got we were beginning to work on on developing something for that. We kind of got sidetracked when the garage decided to have a melt another meltdown. Um, so we kind of refocused our energies on replacing <laughs> the garage technology. But we are looking at doing a kind of a more holistic study of parking and our parking demand and our parking inventory and you know, those kinds of things. So that's something we're developing. Uh, several of our cities in, in Massachusetts have done similar things. The city of Salem did one a couple of years ago. Um, so we are trying to, we are doing that, which may help guide some of the information that you're looking for. And the only other thing I was going to caution is that, you know, like, Util is no longer, that was sort of a, a very limited uh, assignment that they did as paid for by mass development. So if we wanted Util to come back, we would need to contract with them and pay for that. So yeah, they're 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 off the clock. This was kind of their work product, and they had a very limited time, unfortunately, because I really enjoyed working with Tim and, and their firm. I don't know if you take you know, a look at their stuff, but I mean they're just doing amazing stuff all around the country. So anyway, does anybody else have any thoughts? I agree. Yeah. I think that we should look for other parking, and I don't think the lower portion, I think the parking should be all under the building, and the rest of it should be a park. Uh, I know parks are expensive, but if you go to any great city in the world, they all have huge parks. Washington, D.C. has about 25. And I think that this building is not just that building.
it might be cost prohibitive, if I recollect correctly, right next to the Mill River, there used to be two car pits, which I believe are still there for the time of ground, the time of the cap. So that changed it from a brown side to a black side. <laughs> Oh, the carpets were interesting. They were fun to play. <laughs> <laughs> but I really see that it needs to be integrated into the town. I like this third rendition of two buildings and parking under it, but I don't like the sprawl of parking if you stand in the back to the right. I think that should be. I'm, I'm trying to visualize what, when you say to the right. To the right of. this open part that's not part of the garage. And I, I think some of that could be eliminated. And some of that could be a park. And some of it, it could be like a green space, and then it could have parking. At, so at you're talking the on the other side of the roundhouse, going yeah. back that way. Right. To not have the parking there, but to have more green space there? Have more green space so that there was a park, so that all of those woods, or what used to be woods, was, had access, people had access to it. Mm -hmm. make it look nice, make it look like a park. Mm -hmm. Might have some more trees out. And then where did you see the building going? I see the building going basically where they put it, but further back from the last park, so the park itself had a bigger. Uh -huh. and it would be the walkway that comes the right way or the walkway that comes from South Street and going down. And then I'm hoping there's room between the existing roundhouse and this new building to have another foot traffic access. Uh -huh. And then I also think that it should come where old South Street is, joint Main Street, should be a way to turn into this that is inviting. It should be perhaps closer to the, uh, the, round, the new roundhouse building. Uh, I guess it would be the Mill River end. That's where the driveway should be. And there would then be room. If we could dig, if we found that part, I think is past where I remember the Provided we can find a place for like 40 people. I don't see building like that. I appreciate the desire for additional green space downtown. And there were a variety of options that had been offered, ranging from the reclamation of the Mill River, the connection on uh, Route 66 to downtown which would involve significant Army Corps engineering plans and great cost to the city, state, and federal government, um, which I don't think anyone perceives that as, as an opportunity at present. Um, the other piece is that we've got some structural challenges with the building for the South Street Apartments, where there needed to be consideration for the residents there that had been raised. Um, but it also would involve some changeover of the property lines following the plan that you designed. So we need to move the property line. So that would involve city council action. But I guess for me, one of the concerns I would have just with that conceptually is that if we add to public space, if the desire to surplus this lot is to add to our tax base, by adding to the public space, which then is maintenance, we may be getting any gain from the surplus. Okay. I'm not talking about 
acres. Okay. I'm just talking about the place where people would walk. Okay. Just sort of not knowing how that would play out. Well, I know they had a picture yeah. on, this, on the slide. They had one that showed a big, huge green space. Okay. I'm, I'm saying, you know, maybe a limited 20 or 30 parking spaces on that side. Okay. And that land there, I think, is already part of this, where those trees are. Okay. But what, what I think you're pointing out is that once the requirement for uh, maintaining uh, no loss of parking is removed, then there's a whole universe of possibilities that get opened up that we haven't entertained yet because everybody presumed that that was not flexible. Well, I presume that too. Now with the zoning change. Right. Saying, right. Okay, no, I think it's just 30 spaces away from there. Still have parking on the ground, yeah. but nowhere near as much. And possibly would open up the, a lot that could be built on. And if you didn't have so much parking, you could pull the building a little bit back from the last two cars and fill that area, which is why the building would have to be parking underneath. Right. Because nobody's going to want to live there up against a blank wall that's concrete. And if you pulled it back, then you could go off to the side toward the brown house and have another walkway down. Um, Mayor, what's the time frame for the parking study now that the, uh, 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 we're we're, we're trying to work on a, um, we're working, trying to work on an RFP at this point uh, to get it completed and we were going to actually try to consult with the Transportation and Parking Commission about it as well. Um, so we're, I'm hoping to get it, get it going, uh, get it out on the street. My hope would be in the next, uh, you know, b before, before the end of this fiscal year, so by the end, before the end of June, May and June. Um, yeah, April, May, June. So that's my hope. Because it seems like it would be difficult to make a rational analysis of what we need out there for parking until that mm -hmm. study is completed. Yeah. So do we I need to be as pointed as to recommend to transportation then that part of that RFP include the possibility of city council entertaining a change to the parking requirements? Because if we don't provide that specificity, then we're just going to be getting back a report that's based on... Assume it's that, could be, right. that could certainly be given as a, as a as study a point, an issue to be studied, to focus in on, certainly. And you also have four members of the city council sitting here. <laughs> we don't want to sit here meeting after meeting when it's pointless. <laughs> right. and, the, and, the chair, and the chair of the transportation it's, park is also in this too. So, um, so that, yeah, we can definitely... I mean, part of the part of what we want to be able to test is this notion: Do we have enough? Do we not have enough parking in Northampton, or is or are there things we can be doing in terms of management, in terms of uh, you know, uh, you know pricing, and all, you know all those kinds of issues that actually can sometimes drive your parking supply. So we want to take another look at that. And I think the last study was done like twelve years ago. 12 years ago. Um, and I think a lot has changed and since then. We've had new parking structures. We now actually do have a new structure on the north side. You know, the, the parking garage for the police is now available after hours um, and on weekends, so that's added to the parking supply. So there's, you know, there's some other things that have happened since 2005. So zip cars, which you may hear about later, and those kinds of things. Oh, go ahead. Well, then I, I think this is what you were saying, which I was getting to earlier. I'm not sure this will be much of a fruitful conversation until we understand the parking needs. Otherwise, we just talk in general. So, and, and it affects the project so dramatically. No one can be there. It's almost like we need to. I guess we could talk about some other pieces. I don't know what those would be, but there's. it seems to affect everything about this project. Mm -hmm. If we suddenly remove or change the parking requirements. As does the toxicity as the, yes, those two things. Yeah. Until we know those two things, I'd like to understand what are the other things we could be discussing. I'm not sure there are so many of those. I guess the, the other thing that, that we could discuss is, I think when this first started, it was seen as a developer's project. And it's clear from Util that it's a public-private partnership. And I'm not clear what the financial resources are. I mean, I know those financial resources of the city are practically nil. But I have no idea if there is money to expand a park on a federal or state grant or how that would work because the less land we provide to the developer, 
the less incentive, perhaps, for development to happen. So that's, I kind of like to get a better sense about what public monies. Yeah, I think, what, I think what Tim had been referring to, uh, and I, I think there's a reference to it somewhere in here, was that one idea was you could look at, um, you know, could the city perhaps, because the city has this larger parking need, could the city um, fi help to find public financing for the garage structure piece, for example? That was one of the ideas that we kicked around. Unfortunately, a lot of those funding sources that were available, you know, 20 years ago when we built our garage are no longer in play. Um, and, but there are, you know, I noticed Greenfield is seeking some funding through the transportation bond bill that the legislature is debating for $6 million to build a municipal parking garage. Uh, and so the thought was, could there be some, um, if in fact, if this is a marginal project as they describe, meaning the numbers are very marginal in terms of who could finance it and make it work, is there a way that there could be public dollars to help leverage uh, particularly for the public amenity part of it, um, and that that may be a way to make it happen. So I think that's what he was referring to. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously we have a public, I mean, the, 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 the resolution also specified that they needed to um, improve and enhance the connection to Pulaski Park. That was the other piece that the development had to do. Um, so whether that is something that the developer does, or it's something we do in partnership, uh, or I don't know. So those those are the kinds of things I think he was referring to mm -hmm. in terms of public private. Um, but again, then that gets into issues about you know a where would we get up, come up with the money, and and would have, what would be the arrangement of this parking garage if it was paid for with public dollars? You know, would it still be owned by a private entity? What would the pricing be, et cetera? So there, there's a lot of issues that we have to talk about. But that I think is what you. Apology, you might be playing out there for city councilors here, so I would suggest that you consider support for a TIF as part of a potential um, RFP for the project. That might be part of the financial incentive for a private developer to come into the project. Uh, tax and tax yeah, tax tax yeah. financing. Uh -huh. so we also have like property tax. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 So that that helps to make it more viable economically. Just ask the question that is. Usually the TIFs have gone to places that do a good deal of hiring, this is my experience, whether it's Coca-Cola, I think Colt Morton got one, um, the, the Gazette, I believe, got one, uh, Big Y. They tend to be places that I think part of the TIF requirement has to do with hires and ongoing hires, and they will, so therefore that would change, again, you could apply for TIF, but it might change the nature of what's being put in. Am I, am I correct on that? Is that still some of the requirement um, of the TIF? It is tied to job creation under the TIF program that we currently have. And you have to show an increase in that job creation. Right? Well, you have to so agree, you have to agree with some targets. Yeah. Partially, the first floor of the building was commercial. That's right. That needs to apply for that. Just on a personal note, I don't think I would support commercial development at the end of the last point. And I'm not sure that there would be consensus in the community to have commercial development there. I think there's, there was a real sense when the hotel was going in there that it was public space being given over to a private interest and people were not wild about the fact that the public was going to be getting very little out of that project. So I just have some real reservations about thinking about the backdrop of Pulaski Park being commercial development. I think when, yeah, I think, we're lower down. Right. Well, I think when, um, when Tim was speaking about this, he was talking about commercial development. But I think in more appeal, he was talking about could there be a restaurant there that kind of opens onto the park, which you'll see in other city parks, kind of that's right. connected. Yeah. So not commercial yeah. development. Yeah. Right. Manufacturer. Yeah. Somebody yeah. making machine parts. Yeah. Yeah. Restaurants, right. gallery, yeah. 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 Yes. I mean, yeah. restaurants, yeah. and retail spaces. If we kept a lot of the parking, then we might land a few people. I know many years ago, Gap looked at a couple of places in North Hampton, maybe we couldn't do it. I just, I, I have, have to, uh, I have to leave because um, I have to go to a Smith Vote Trustees meeting at five o'clock. I just wanted to leave you with just one thought, and that is even, um, you know, in the time that we've been having this discussion, 
uh, you know, we've gotten inquiries from companies that have asked us about, you know, available sites in Northampton and available sites, and in some cases it's been someone who, um, uh, you know, wants to basically just build a, a small sort of office building, um, and, and uh, you know, sort of on the same scale as, as well, not quite that scale, but not with a, with a giant round building on it, but, you know, maybe a building of that size, um, we've had inquiries about that, and people have asked about the roundhouse lot. Um, so I just throw that out there because, you know, that another, you know, one other permutation could be a small building that doesn't generate, all, that doesn't take up all of the parking lot, um, but does provide something there and does provide some improvements to the connectivity between the park. I mean, I realize it's not as exciting as a floating park over Pulaski Park, but it also may be something that would be financeable and, and also would fit in with the environmental issues, et cetera. So that's just another, I will tell you, we have gotten a lot of inquiries from people who are interested in the space in Pulaski Park, but not necessarily to build a huge, giant, you know, parking garage slash other building. Um, we've had people ask us about, could we just could we build just a small building there? So I throw that out to you as another just thing to think about. Um, I think the main thing is, whatever the RFP is, I think, you know, giving people some flexibility, because I think then that will draw more more ideas and more things to choose from. So anyway, so I'm sorry I have to leave, but I will work to get a presentation together for you from DEP for one of your future meetings um, so that you can at least get a, a, a history and review of what the site is and what's under the ground there. So thank you all for your work on this. Thank you. Um, and Wayne and Terry are here if there's questions to come back to to, um, to me. So thank you. Okay. Ryan? Yeah, I mean, in the, in the spirit of throwing stuff out there, um, one thing I heard, not just at meeting about this, but um, at, a, at a farming meeting, about North, local farming in Northampton, um, was interest in like a community, uh, not community garden, kind of a year-round like farmer's market kind of thing. So that's sort of in between commercial, pure commercial and pure um, public space is something that could be used. Um, but I think that speaks more towards the fact that, you know, I mean, there's any number of creative ideas that are out there, and I, I don't know how likely it is that we'll hit on the correct one at, as, a, as a committee. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that would be the advantage of a public-private partnership, is all, all these ideas would emerge as, as the mayor's. But in the spirit of throwing things out there, I think that kind of year-round um, farmer's market is an interesting one. I mean, there's permutations of it that would go to. Personally, I, I think there needs to be more community involvement than whatever happens. But I think right now we don't have the parameters to really have a community meeting yet until we get some questions answered. I think the toxicity and the parking are the two main ones. I don't know whether uh, at, at this point we should move something or whether we should adjourn until we get further information come back when certainly the DP whoever come, will come from Columbia Gas or whoever to address that issue. I'd like to suggest we wait until and then and hope they can come back soon, but until they do, I can feel like we're just kind of talking so generally about all this that we need first the toxicity issue, at least we can have some parameters on that. And I think if there's anything we can do is, is again, get some framework on when might a, the parking study, the more general parking study, be completed. Um, if we're talking about, I don't know if you have any idea, Wayne, but I mean, it, we need some some direction on that, again, if, I feel, before we can have uh, fruitful discussions. So that, that's the transportation right now, that Mr. Uh, Lindy, or it's going to be on your agenda? Well, I think it's something the mayor is pursuing. Um, yeah. the, the commission hasn't seen it in a part of it. But I think we will. I mean, it's, it's towards the conclusion. Uh, is there any further discussion? Yeah. So, if I'm understanding correctly, we probably will not meet again until the mayor comes back with people to come and speak to us about the toxicity. And then we'll definitely need another meeting to talk about parking. And then we'll have to talk about community involvement as well. Is that 
pretty much what everybody thinks. Mm -hmm. Sounds right. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Could you, could you relay that to the mayor? We are adjourning this yes. committee to then resume the vote. Yes. yes. So, uh, do I call a motion? Do, do we move to adjourn? Can I so so move? Second. Second. Aye. 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 Maybe we still recognize each other. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, thinking about it like that, they have, I believe, already every incentive to want to be in Northampton. They have a successful program up at Smith showing that it can be successful in Northampton. Um, so I don't see why they would need it for free. Because I, I think, because in, in my opinion, designated parking in a, in a covered garage is, is quite generous and maybe even overly generous, but, but generous, but for free. Um, I just I, I just can't see it as fair. Um, it's it's subsidizing this mega mega corporation that really doesn't need the revenue. We need it a lot more. And and the other part of the, my fairness issues are. I used to have a pass. I no longer have it because I moved to Florence. I used to have a pass in the garage. It was in, in, and it went up through the years. It was forty-five dollars, and it was ninety, and then it was seventy. Now it's ninety. And and as Mr. Winston, I think, was referring to or alluding to when he was addressing this committee earlier, um, there, there are there are there um, are times when, as a leaseholder, you you can't get a spot. Um, down in the designated area, so you have to use the rest of the garage, which is fine. But there are times where leaseholders can't, none are available. I, I've had time when I, times when I used to be a leaseholder where um, I, there was not a spot in the garage. The, the, this, this, it was entirely full, and I had to park, you know, I had to find another spot outside of the garage, even though I was paying, so I had to pay twice, so the city collected twice, twice in that case. So I, so I don't see how it's fair to give Zipcar free spots you're, there's there's an avail, availability based on what I'm describing. Um, it, there's an issue with availability already. There are 70 leaseholders I've, I've come to find out in doing a little research. Uh, excuse me, 70 spots down below and 100 permit, um, and 100 leaseholders with permits right now. Um, and uh, there's a one in a year and a half waiting list. And, and I was told that they could fill the garage with just the waiting list alone. So I don't I don't um, I don't I don't I just don't see this as fair. Um, I know I know we should do a cost and benefit analysis of this, and you have to weigh you know the revenue we're giving up with, with with the environmental benefit. But for me, there also has to be the backdrop of fairness in any legislation. And um, if, if I understand this concept correct correctly, um, it doesn't create any jobs. So you know, whereas we give you know tips to companies that may uh, where they get tax breaks on, on a limited part of the property for li on the growth of the property for a limited period of time. Um, this, I don't think this creates a single job, so I don't think job job, job creation can be justified. Please correct me if I'm wrong on that, because that's just what I think. I, um, but those are my issues with fairness. Um, so if you could address those, please. Sure. So let me just sort of three different things that I can do. Um, the first is just so it's clear what the ordinance is that's before you, because there'd be two things we'll be asking council to vote on. The first is the ordinance. So we have set fees for parking spots. And so the ordinance that's before you basically says, as the council said, to create a fee, a fee of zero for these spots. But the other ordinance, the other action that goes to council at the same time, it hasn't gone to council yet because it doesn't need to get referred out. But it's, in essence, to declare these two spots surplus and authorize the mayor to negotiate a lease for them. That lease is not necessarily going to be a free lease. I'm assuming it's not going to be a free lease. So we wouldn't have a set fee. We don't charge you 25 cents an hour, 50 cents an hour. But the mayor would be negotiating a lease, and he'd be getting whatever he could get for that lease. So I just passed out that second piece. So again, our, our plan was the ordinance would come to EDLU, and then would go to ordinance committee, and then would be referred back to council. And when it's referred back, this leasing piece would go into the package at the same time. So council would be discussing both at the same time. Um, so, so again, I think there would be some fee that, that's associated with that. We've talked to Zip, and they're certainly amenable depending on what that, that fee so, is. Let me just understand. So the logic of that would be, hopefully, that you would actually get a larger fee than the normal fee. Otherwise, no, it wouldn't be a larger fee. It wouldn't be larger. Okay. So it could be so, the amount that leaseholders It could be the amount that leaseholders currently pay. It, it's possible we might look at what's the revenue we get. Lots of I guess it would, I, I would like you to address the question though. Why would we have any change sure. at all? I like if you do have a car service committee, yeah. why not just say, okay, look, even if not even addressing the second issue, do we have too many leases right now? But why don't we just charge them exactly what we have? Why don't we? Sure. So, so that's sort of what was the second issue, which is you can measure this different ways. So I don't want to give you a number, but no matter how you look at it, some subsidies go into our parking system. The parking garage itself. The space, three quarters of the price of each of those spaces, 
was covered by a state grant. All the spaces we get are not paying property tax. Um, you could, and all the spaces we're giving up other commercial uses. So spaces cost the city a lot. You know, a, a, a small coffee shop takes up the same amount of space as four parking spots. So every four parking spots means we give up a coffee shop down there. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, and we're not getting property tax on those things again. So we're heavily subsidizing the parking system. Right now, if you stood in front of the parking garage on most days and measured people coming to the parking garage, you would find the vast majority, not so much on Thursday and Friday night, but the vast majority during the rest of the time, are single occupancy vehicles. So what we're subsidizing is single occupancy vehicles, the very kind of vehicles we're saying we like to most disturb you know, again. Zip car and the enterprise equivalent, and, and the, is, there's three of these big services. Zip car is the biggest one, but there are, there are three of them. All of them use the figure somewhere between 10 and 15 state of private cars get eliminated for each car that they bring. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I, I would totally agree with Jesse's issue about fairness, but I guess I'd turn around and say that fairness to me is a spot that can serve 15 different users, or three or 15 different spots. Um, you're not right, you're not sharing any cars, but the last time the city looked at it, we had a deficit of about 200 parking spots downtown, again, this is a decade ago. Each parking spot, if we create a new spot downtown, is probably going to cost us about $20,000 in space. So if we free up 15 spaces, or 14 spaces, that would be one, that's a good way to, to make our system more efficient, to serve more people, to serve residents downtown. And let me use me as an example. I walk or bicycle or get a lift from my wife on her way to work every day, except when I need my car to drive, to, to drive for city business. So I'm filling up the parking spot many days downtown because, you know, because there's no zip car that's here. Um, and so providing those things gets rid of some number of people like me, some number of people who live downtown. I'm one of those people who hopefully would be displacing one of those cars. Um, and, and so I, I guess I think the fairness is part of the same thing. And I guess the, the final piece about the big corporation, you know, at a gut level, I absolutely agree. I don't really like the idea of supporting a you know, half billion dollar corporation. But I guess, you know, Every one of those cars out there is made by a multi-billion dollar corporation out there. So, yes. I don't understand how that's not, I'm not giving free spaces to them. I mean, how does that analogy work? Well, be, because we're giving, up, we're giving up a fair amount of property tax for having to use those spaces. You know, parking spots are dead air. If you go to a mall, malls will count. If you have an empty store, they'll look at how dramatically you get less business past the empty store. And so one of the problems with parking spots, besides the fact we don't get revenue, is it makes it undesirable to walk. People don't like walking by parking lots. They like walking by live places. Um, and we need, I mean, I'm not arguing against parking lots. We need parking spots to make downtown vibrant. But we do want to always look at how can we have as few as possible? How can we not have more than we need to do? Um, and so there is, in essence, a subsidy that the city makes in terms of land use, in terms of property taxes, in terms of grants for parking spots. And so we need to figure out what, how do we use that subsidy to serve the best, the greatest good. Is there any indication that these services care how much that subsidy is? I, I think that speaks to it, Jesse's point. It's a number that. piece. You know, Smith gives them space for free. Um, that's typically been, you know, until about five years ago, four years ago, the model was Zip and the other ones, the competitors, would only go in places where their, their spaces were free. The places have started charging, um, and so they're now addressing that. And so it really depends. You know, it's a... Um, it's a thin, razor thin margin, so it depends on how much the space. You know, if you're renting a car for 8.50 an hour, um, we don't want the car to spend nine dollars an hour. So, so um, I think that's really the issue. So, what points it worth their while for doing? It. Um, they're, they're at Smith. They're it's about 600 feet away from the parking garage. Um, we're trying to expand and do what it comes there. The, the, the normal rule of thumb is people don't want to walk for more than 500 feet to their car. So, the closer it is, the more you expand and do what you. I guess, you know, even reading in the Gazette where they picked up on the, uh, the latest UN climate change stuff, which is very frightening. If we have companies like Zipcar, which I remember when they just got started, it was like, are these guys going to make it? And I was hoping they'd make it. So now they've made it. So now I can say, oh, you guys can make it. I'd like to make it as easy as possible for them. But I do think it brings up the, the question you're raising. is like, we're, what are they doing in other places? So if they started and they needed at the beginning, they needed that kind of free space. Jesse raises a good point, which is 
do they still need that, or is this a way that, you know, now we've made a huge profit, this company's really going, I'm glad they're going, I think it's important, um, and I'd like to see them grow even bigger, and God bless them to make a profit, because then hopefully they can pour it back in, but it really raises that question that you're asking, is, well, you know, what do they need at this point? Yeah, I think it depends on the market. I mean, you know, so they began in New York and Boston, Cambridge, I mean, it was Cambridge and Boston originally expanded that. Yeah. And in those markets, first they're charging a lot more for the cars, but second, there's still an amazing deal for those places. And so those cars are often used for 10 or 12 hours a day. We're a more marginal market. So we tried to, let me give you a history. We tried to get Zipcar here 10 years ago. Um, and we met with Zipcar. We were really excited about it. We did a survey of the community and asked how many people would sign up for Zipcar. Had a fair number of people. And Zipcar said, your market's too small. We're only doing it through guaranteed market. That is, the city would guarantee to get $10,000 a year of business which was the number at the time, and we would make up that gap if they didn't do it, and we, not surprisingly, said, we're not interested. So then Smith College built Ford Hall. By the calculations, they would have had to build about a 400 space parking garage for it. We worked with them and said, you talk about bringing zip car anyway, bring zip car and do a bunch of other things, a long list of mitigation they did, and we wouldn't have to build this parking garage. And so Smith gave that guarantee to them. They guaranteed $10,000 a year of business, um, I don't know if they paid the first year, but I know after the first year, Zip had enough business that it didn't cost them anything. Zip has really just changed the model literally in the last four or five months. Uh, and we're one of the first communities coming in saying, so their old model was basically two things. Big cities, Boston, New York, Cambridge, San Francisco, they did at their own risk. Small communities, they only did at the community's risk. And I think without exception, the only people who do that risk were colleges. <laughs> so Amherst College has it, Smith College has it, two dozen campuses around the country have it. They, UC Davis has it, a bunch of schools too. And so, so it's really only been this year, or maybe last year, when they started saying, well, we're willing to start doing these small markets at, at, at our own risk. And, and so to me, that's an enormous piece. It's not a clear profit model. It's very likely that the model's not going to work in some communities that they could probably wait for. So I certainly think someday charging for rates are fine, and I'd probably say charging for some rates are fine. But is it's an early market, I'm not sure we're there yet. I, I would just like to kind of convey the sense of the Transportation and Party Commission, which, which looked at this, and, um, and said so okay to it, obviously, um, and, and communicate three things. Um, the first is that, you know, my understanding is this is not about zip car. So it's not <clears throat> zip cars are named in here, it's not a tip agreement in that sense. It's just for shared cars. That's the first thing. The second thing is, um, I also do understand this to be not a requirement that it's recharged on money. And uh, you know, my mind is open as to whether or not we ask for money or not for what period of time. You know, in theory, the mayor could say, you know, it's it's free for a year or something. Or the mayor could say, you know, it's it's never going to be free. And I don't know what I favor with that regard, but I know that. These two things are silent on that. At least that was my understanding. And third, I think um, this gets to the, you know the point about the garage being full. Am I correct in, in reading this that these could go in other places downtown besides the garage? That's correct. Um, that was my understanding. In fact, I, I tend to think that would, would be better because it would displace people from the garage and it'd be more visible and useful. For people. That's what what that's what my question was. Oh, okay. Does this have to be in the garage? Or? It does, and I think visibility is a key, and snow issues are an issue in the winter for, for doing like moving cars right. around. But beyond that, no, I mean, I think they wouldn't want to be in the far corner of the roundhouse lot. Right. But, you know, the Hamden Avenue lot across from the garage is just fine. Wouldn't it have to be, though? I mean, they're not going to be, these cars will be, sit, will be sitting unused for periods of times, and they're like snow emergencies and things, so. Right, who would be responsible? Yeah. I mean, it might have to be. Well, it's certainly doable. I mean, communities do that. I mean, Zip has local people whose job it is, is to move cars around for doing it. I mean, you know, many cities allow these on constant spaces on the street. And so clearly that comes up. It becomes more complicated. It means the cars are unavailable for customers at certain times. Um, you know, Smith College has them put four cars in the parking garage and two cars somewhere else on campus. I'm not sure what two cars are. Um, and so clearly that can move those two cars around for snow pieces. So do think, is it possible that they will be employing people? 
I, yeah, but I mean, I, I'm not trying to sell the argument. It's not a lot. You know, somebody has to somebody has to hit the car and for oil changes, someone has to move the car to certain snow emergencies. So yes, they do somebody. But it's, this is not, you know, if it's six cars already doing two more, it's usually a local garage who picks this up for a few dollars. I know that Ernie actually happened to see Zip Car today, but they were doing work on it. So I know Ernie's is doing that. So yes, it's a little bit of money, but I don't want to oversell that. That's not a big piece. So you, you this is my understanding. Users have to pay a membership fee. Seven hundred dollars. And, and then a usage fee. That's for right. usage. Okay. And 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 this is an ordinance form, right? The, this is an ordinance. That's correct. Uh, so. Um, so says, it, sorry, the one I just passed out is the lease, and they both be approved by council. The one that was in your package I didn't pass out was the ordinance itself. Okay. So the ordinance. So this is where where is this right now? That is not being introduced because I wanted to wait until it came out of ordinance committee. So when ordinance committee reports out the ordinance, this will get introduced to council at the same meeting. So, you, so as a full council, you can be looking at the lease and the ordinance at the same time. Okay. Um, now, th this says uh, the mayor is authorized to sign renewable leases in compliance with MGL Chapter 30B to allow car sharing services to use these spaces and associated space for information signage in return for making these services available to Northampton residents and, and, and visitors at no cost to the city. But, I mean, well, a couple questions here. Does this mean that only Northampton residents are allowed to use these particular zip cars? No, that's why it's Northampton residents and visitors. Okay, so, now, so I got it's no cost to the city, but but every but everyone has to everyone has to pay the the, the, the membership fee and the user fee. Right. So the membership fee is like fifty dollars a year, I believe is the number. And then when you actually use a car, you pay. Um, you don't pay for gas, so that the fee is it's less than it sounds. So you pay eight fifty not an hour, but you're not paying for gas for the vehicle. And again, that, that they vary what the car rates are. Like I used this in Pittsburgh when I was there. Um, and I think I paid a different rate in Pittsburgh. So you know, the rates vary depending on what city you're in. So I, I think, I mean, uh, we, can, we can mandate in, in this document, when you hand it out the lease, what the price should be set at. Maybe the lease to, this, to them or what the, what well, the price is? Other it? terms and conditions that the mayor finds reasonable. I mean, we can mandate. Instead of doing that, we can mandate what cost, right? You certainly could. I mean, generally, we'd leave those things to the mayor because that lets him respond to market conditions and see what's happening. Right, but in this case, I think if we put a specific amount, it could address the, the concerns raised here about um, them, about Zipcar or whatever company, paying the same rate that anyone else in the past. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly legal. The, the, the cumbersome nature is um, it doesn't let them respond, so you could go through this whole process and then, you know, say we're enterprise and say we're not interested in doing this. If, if, I, I would actually not support that because if the mayor is the one in negotiation with this, and we're basically, we're stepping into a major piece of the negotiation. I, I mean, I want the zip cars to come. I also hear your concerns. Um, and I'd like them to come. I'd like them because they are profitable, profitable to, to pay. And I hope we get some money from that. But I also don't want to tie the mayor's hands in this and lose them coming in because I think, um, I could understand they're not wanting to be in the small communities. And I remember back, we were talking about this in Italy years ago, trying to get them in. I was disappointed they didn't want to come in, that they've only been at, been at Smith. Um, so I'd like them to be here. And I, you know, part of this is, do we trust the mayor to do that negotiation in a way that's reasonable so they come in and we get, get some money from them? I mean, I, I liked your comment, Ryan, that you were saying, look, we could encourage the mayor to do this on a year basis or a two-year basis. Then you reevaluate and say, hey, it's been very, now they know they're successful here. See, I could understand them not wanting to come in because they didn't want to come in before. So we have that as a history. I could understand they're saying, look, we're willing to come in and do this. And then two years, they're doing pretty well. We could say, you know what? Pay even more than the normal fee. We'll give you the space here. And we'll, whatever, we want to negotiate that. Um, so did you say that they, they need they originally asked for guaranteed ten thousand dollars a year. So that was when we were here a decade ago. Okay. And city would have to be negotiated seriously. Is there like a for anyone that they negotiate a guaranteed amount? Is do you know what that amount is? I'm just trying to guess. Like, would two thousand dollars be worth it for them? You know, I mean, who am I to judge? But they they have to be convinced that the car. I mean, again, my ten thousand dollars is an old figure. 
They have to be convinced they can keep the cars busy enough for that amount. They wouldn't be interested in a small market. Right. It's so more they're they're interested in. So, so they've looked at, there's no one from the press here, they've looked at Northampton, and 31% of the use of Smith College is non Smith associated. Oh. Um, and so that's sort of what gives them some comfort. No, you know, I'm one of those people. The mayor is one of those people. Um, I don't know how good their numbers are, I and mean, those are people who don't have Smith EDU emails. Maybe their spouses, and so I'm not sure how good they are. But um. do, do we have an increasing number of people who live within walking distance of downtown who don't have cars? Do we know anything about this? Anecdotally, yes, but we don't have good data. Don't really know. There, are a lot of, there are a lot of landlords who will say yes. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of residents who would say, oh, the neighbor's overwhelmed with cars. Mm -hmm. So we see both senses of mm -hmm. doing them. And we don't but really know. We don't really know. Mm -hmm. that. But I, what we do know, actually, mm -hmm. we do know nationwide, the number of people driving is dropping yeah. dramatically, yeah. especially people in their, their, their yeah. 20s. Yeah. So our demographic, people who live downtown, nationwide shopping, there's no reason to think it's not represented here. Well, we're talking about a new structure right here, and the question of whether you have to put a parking lot in, or I mean a parking space in for every apartment, and I was just wondering if we had any data on that one. Right. You know, it, uh, Todd, who stand pillar together, the new pastor of First Churches, he tells the story when he moved to State Hospital. When he moved to State Hospital, he went down and talked to his bank and said, how much can I afford for this? And incidentally, I work downtown, I'm trying to go from being a two-car family to a one-car family, if I could walk. And they told him we can get $80,000 additional mortgage because he's not carrying the mortgage car payment on that piece. So I think we're seeing more of those kinds of people. You know, in my case, frankly, if there's a car, it's having an 18-year-old who takes my car three days a week. So if zip car stops, we can go with three cars. It's really going to be down from two, but that's good. Yeah. Is there any further discussion on this? I don't have any business to say anything about going to it. I rent two apartments walking distance from Main Street. The stipulation is they can have one vehicle. I never have any problem renting it. I don't know where they put the other vehicle, but this has been going on for seven years. So, yeah. they do do it. I, I uh, would comment that from the numbers you were reading at the beginning uh, of your statement that uh, uh, on sales volume and profitability, that's a, a, a indeed a razor thin uh, profit margin. Um, and so my suspicion is that um, if uh, if their habit has been historically that they only will go in and place with free uh, spaces available and they stay away from small markets, that it will probably be difficult to get them to con be convinced. Um, on the other hand, as Paul was suggesting, that a couple of years from now, <coughs> after they've documented the uh, uh, volume that they can expect, then I think the mayor has a different basis for negotiation. So, uh, I, if, if, if we were to approve it, I, I would uh, suggest a, a sunset that has to be negotiated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree to a sunset too. I, I, and also, I think Jesse made the second point, which is the fairness issue of people wanting to be in the garage. And that, to me, would be the second issue, which I do understand. Like, you buy the lease, you're supposed to be in the garage, and you go there, and there's no space. It's like, so would it be, you know, <coughs> instead of in the John, get, you know, it's specified in the garage. Why doesn't it just say, we'll provide some space in the city? Why is that specifically outlined? Just say, hey, we'll give you some space in the city. Because then I think, I do agree with you on the fairness issue of where people are parking and they buy those leases. But that's visible. Yeah, and they want to be visible anyway, so it would seem to me that, you know, give them somewhere else. Well, it also seems to be set up. I, I was unaware that there's 100 leaseholders for 70 spaces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That already seems like... Yeah, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you uh, give a couple away for free in addition to that, then that's an extra reason to do that. I'm not sure you need to invite them. So if you want to just strike the, in the John Pierre third parking garage. Yeah, well, uh, you haven't presented this yet? I mean, this is what we're looking at. Would you, this is not actually before us. Before so the ordinance, ordinance is before you. The That's the one that I would strike the John Gear. Okay, because, okay, okay. okay. No, I would strike the John Gear, and I'm not sure if in, the other one that? already has like, the other one already says in John Gear garage and or in service parking lots. So the lease already has the language that you're suggesting. It's the ordinance where striking John Gear parking lots. Okay. 
And then the second piece, I agree, if we could, do we put this in the agreements council, if there was some, if we agreed to it, something like, you know, a, a sunset. This is not perpetuity, this is, you know, in two years we look at it and... I think that, wouldn't it make more sense to, if we're going to do that, to do that in a to the lease, to the lease, what way and uh, oh, okay. the lease rather than okay, um, yeah. Actually, I mean, we could put it in the ordinance. Uh, <coughs> and actually, we don't have the ordinance. I have the ordinance and not in this form in front of me. So, I, um, if, if, it, if it we're in front of me, I mean, I, I mean, we're going to do it in the ordinance. If that's a good question. So, but um, would you mind striking that language when you present before you present this to, to ordinance? That's fine. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It also makes the second sentence sort of unnecessary. Correct. So you can strike that as well. Yeah, well, we, we do want to but strike. you're saying it should be in the lease itself. Maybe it doesn't need to be in the ordinance. Right, since the lease has been introduced, let me play with language about the sunset in the lease. Okay. And then you guys will have a chance to comment about when it comes to the city council. Okay. okay. Yeah, so the motion is then to strike um, is it both, sen yeah. both sentences. In so in the first sentence of the, the whereas, it's in the John. Here, the third parking garage, and then all the second sentence. Yeah. Yeah. So what's what's left is ends of the word signage. Correct. Well, oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's still the next line to be dedicated to commercial car sharing service available in the camping area. Where's the next visitors? Oh, yes. Yeah, it's different here than it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Oh, that's a good catch. Wayne, would you read the ordinance as you have it? Yes. Notwithstanding other subsections of this se section, the mayor may authorize free parking space and associated signage to be dedicated to commercial car sharing services, development of Hampton residents and visitors. Is it, is it necessary or appropriate to also? In addition to saying free, just to spell out that, or the mayor could negotiate. So, it would say that the mayor may lease parking space and associated signage. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry, how, how, how is it? Not saying other sections of this, uh, the other subsection of the section, the mayor may lease parking space and associated signage. Mm -hmm. Except, yeah. But then the word free is gone, is that? Correct. Right. Because so, you're, all you're doing here is letting them lease it. You could lease it for free. Or yeah, or you could lease it for a dollar. Yeah. Right. So, or whatever. Okay. In a way, I like that better because mm -hmm. it's cleaner. And, yeah. Okay. Is, is there is there any, well is there a motion to um, amend this as, as I make a motion to amend as Wayne has Wayne just right. presented it. Is there any further discussion on this matter? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, so now, now we have it. Now, now, the next matter to discuss is um, whether or not we want to send this forward to a. Uh, if, whether or not we, how how we want to send this forward to ordinance. Um, I make a motion whether we recommend or not. Recommend. I make a motion to recommend. Okay. Motion made and seconded. Is there any further discussion on this matter? I'm going to, I'm going to uh, vote. I'm going to vote to extend it forward with a, with a positive recommendation, but I, I want to consider it further, even, even as amended. All those, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And now we'll move on to CDBG presentation. I need to, I need to go in five minutes. So. I think if, if I walk out, it's because I need to go with something.
For you because I saw language in December that mandated my presence. <laughs> um, I think I'm under the impression now that I'm not mandated, but I'm still happy to be here for informational purposes. Um, <coughs> this uh, July 1, 2014, we enter into year 31 of our entitlement award from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So there are several components to the program. Uh, the way that the allocation comes to us uh, mandates that 15% of the dollar amount go for public services. So your counterpart, the Social Services Veterans Culture and Recreation Committee, um, embarked on a process to deliberate on applications for the public services piece. So you see that dollar amount um, on the back of your page at the top. There were 12 different applications that came forward and we are currently trying to assign dollar amounts to those folks. There's also a 20% requirement cap for administration and planning costs. And then the rest of the dollars are pretty much available for projects, programs, activities that will benefit low and moderate income folks in the city. So traditionally we do outreach to central services and the Department of Public Works and just put feelers out to see if anybody's got projects that they want us to consider. We are coming to the end of probably eight years of a big amount that has been traditionally going to the senior center to pay down the debt for the construction costs. We have one more payment. Um, it's usually in the area of $300,000. We've got one left for that $145,000 figure. And then I think the city is on the hook for several years hence, but CDBG will not be, so that will give us a little flexibility. Um, I've been doing this part of the work for maybe two or three years, but um, all my predecessors before me had the pleasure of dealing with higher dollar amounts. Um, there were days that we were up close to a million. Um, two years ago we had about $588,000 to allocate this year, it kicked up a little bit, but um, it's uh, always been tough because there's always more things on the list than the dollars can pay for. But July 1, we're going to be looking at $618,768. So what I have to do is publish what we are thinking about um, at this time of year, and it will solidify as we get closer to the end of the fiscal year and I have to put an action plan together for HUD. So I wanted to let you know at least one of what some of the program components are and make you aware of them. Um, under housing activities, uh, the asterisks indicate dollars that have been previously assigned and the New South Street Apartments project is um, a result of an negotiated <coughs> court settlement based on the hotel. Mm -hmm. Construction, which will not be happening, but we're still obligated to do that. And Mayor Higgins had negotiated that in exchange for additional years of affordability on that apartment building. So they are about, well, as of April 14th, they're going to be start, starting work on the exterior rehabilitation of that project. So you'll be seeing that soon. So that $130,000 has been held for them. There was an ownership change, so it got delayed while well, that all sorted itself out. But um, that project is certainly something we're excited about and has a fairly large dollar amount associated with it. Um, the Housing Authority is moving ahead on the demolition of one of the remaining farmhouses that they acquired through the disposition of the state hospital land. Um, it is slated for home ownership, and that's very exciting to us. It will require a legislative change at the other end of the state because all the disposition agreement um, stated rental housing and they're looking for home ownership opportunities so they need, they need to tweak the language there. 
And I think um, once that house comes down and developers can see what is left on the parcel and what it looks like, I think they'll probably be RFPing that for development, which will give us some new homeownership opportunities. Um, the plan was to maybe provide some next step housing to some families in Hampshire Heights and Florence Heights so they can actually move to homeownership in Northampton, which uh, doesn't always happen. And Valley CDC runs their first time home buyer workshops in their homeownership counseling center. And this is an award that we have made probably every year for as long as I've been here. And um, it supports staff capacity to help people through um, counseling, and financial literacy, and getting bankable, and also hopefully expanding their opportunities to purchase, hopefully in Northampton if we have units available. And this um, down payment assistance is actually two $3,000 grants to help somebody pull all their funding pieces together. Um, public infrastructure, uh, this is a project that came from Wayne. He is hopeful that we can somehow link the pedestrian flow from the River Run Apartments, which is way up on Damon Road, into also planned um, transportation and sidewalk and intersection improvements along Damon Road and then getting to the intersection of um, Damon and King and hopefully and producing pedestrian safety for folks that are coming out of Hampshire Heights and accessing the Pride and all those other commercial establishments around that. So Wayne is currently in communication with the trustees at River Run condominiums to get their blessing. And um, so we're holding that money aside, hoping that that project will also come to fruition this new year. Is there a plan for sidewalks coming down from Hampshire Heights? Um, I don't know about that. I think that is part of the overall access plan, but since we're on the other side of the street, I'm more familiar with getting River Run folks down to Damon Road. So Senior Center Debt Service we talked about. Um, the James House is a city-owned property. You know, it's kind of Mayor Higgins' vision to have a community learning center, and we've had some issues with that building. Um, typical to old buildings, you never really know what you're going to get. Um, we painted it last fall and realized that the columns on the front of the building weren't actually attached to the top pediment, so we had to do some additional work over the winter. And this um, remaining $8,000 is just kind of to repaint and spruce it all up, and hopefully the uh, physical plant improvements for that building will, will be completed. Um, the Literacy Project and the Center for New Americans are in there doing great work, and there's a child care room that is providing services for folks coming in, in and out of the building, and we have a couple offices there that we're hoping either GCC or HCC will take advantage of and really just kind of bring that vision to fruition and give them a building that's um, top-notch in every way. It's interesting that Hampshire County is the only county in Massachusetts without a community college. Yeah. So they're hoping that there's a little bit of a satellite project. <coughs> exactly. There's a Northampton, Northampton Community Education Collaborative that brings all those parties to the table quarterly um, to make sure that all those synergies are happening. So the next three projects there are requests that have come in that we're still sorting through. Um, there are some pretty stringent eligibility requirements for the use of this um, funding source. Um, for instance, Pulaski Park, you know, we found that, that CDBG utilization for projects there are not eligible. You have to kind of do income surveys and make sure that everybody in the neighborhood is income eligible. So for something like the Jackson Street Playground, we have to reach out to um, Hathaway Farms and Hampshire Heights and the other neighborhood um, users to make sure that we can actually do something there. Um, that's really the only one with questionable eligibility, perhaps. Um, Vernon Street School, where Community Action is working with Central Services to make sure that they have a long-term presence there with their Head Start program and other Community Action programming. They need some help with a handicap ramp and some accessibility issues on the first floor, so we're lending our ear to that and, uh, and able to help if they need it. Um, 
And then the uh, Council on Aging and Department of Public Works have asked for monies possibly to install those audio kinds of assistance mechanisms at um, particular <coughs> intersections that are identified by the Committee on Disabilities. The deal with an action plan is if you get to your program year and you want to spend money on something and you haven't already mentioned it in your citizen participation process, then you have to have a public hearing and kind of go back to square one. So that's kind of where we're throwing everything in here to cover all of our bases and hopefully they will all materialize. Um, maybe they all won't, but we uh, just want to cover all our bases to make sure that we're good to go. Economic development, um, the economic development folks, uh, Terry Anderson and Herstead, you know, started this relationship with the fairgrounds and we've been holding money for them for a couple years while they kind of sort through their game plan moving forward. Um, a lot of their planning is dependent on a lot of other things that are out of their control, like legislative earmarks, um, this $3 million allocation that has been assigned, um, exactly what that will pay for. The fairgrounds have issues related to stormwater and damp drainage analyses that are not just site specific, it's kind of <coughs> you know, a whole other ball game. So it's often difficult for them to isolate projects and get a timetable and move forward because there's so many other moving parts to this. But we have worked with them and identified um, some specific buildings that they know they need to demolish regardless of what happens with everything else. And there's a um, slums and delight designation within the block ramp program that allows us to kind of move forward on that. And um, I guess last night the Historic Commission blessed them um, in one of their buildings that uh, is just a little too far gone. So there is something that we're going to be able to move forward with, with the fairgrounds folks. So we'll be contracting with them soon. And Valley CDC does a small micro-business technical assistance program that we have funded for years. Um, they're able to do workshops for folks that are um, looking to do business startups for five employees or less and do some um, business planning, uh, technical systems development with them. So we try not to duplicate services that are being offered by other agencies. So this is just kind of one small piece that they've been able to <coughs> craft as a niche and do well. The um, the public services amount, the social services committee went through, did the interviews, and then we found out that um, the planning department is moving ahead on the sale of a market rate lot at the Garfield Verona Habitat development in Florence. And <coughs> there are program income dollars that can come into the pot um, at different times during the year. And 15% um, of that sales price for that market rate lot is going to be able to be applied to the public services pot. So we wanted to make sure the closing is supposed to happen tomorrow. So we wanted to make sure that happened. And then we, I think we're going to have about $15,000 in addition that we didn't expect to add to the public services total. So um, Gina Louise and her committee with Marianne and um, Elisa Klein and Pastor Weir from First Churches and Rick Hart from the Human Rights Commission We'll reassemble once we know what the final dollar amount is. And um, again, the requests outweigh the amount that we have available, but um, we'll do the best we can to make people as whole as possible. And then administration and planning used to be a cast of thousands, but now it's down to two people, <laughs> myself and Cam Leon, and we've been side by side for almost 20 years. So the uh, staff capacity of she and I have never been city funded. Um, there is a city contribution to our health benefits, but um, Wayne used to have a part at one point. James Thompson, the GIS guy in the planning department, used to have a little bit of CDBG. There was some in the mayor's office. There was some in the economic development mm -hmm. coordinator. Um, but now, with the dollars being cut, we saw a 30% cut um, in the last three years from CDBG in the federal level. So. It's down to Cam and I, and we're lean and mean, and uh, do a lot of other things besides administer the CDBG program. But um, it uh, helps out um, and has benefited by the Community Preservation Act funding hugely. I mean, where CDBG lost its capabilities um, 
CPC was able to pick up a lot in the area of open space and recreation and historic preservation and affordable housing. So it's been a blessing for the city that CPC came online right when CDBG was starting to take a hit across the country. But um, we still try to work in partnership and get done as much as we can for the projects um, that need to address the challenges that low and moderate income folks are, are experiencing in the city. So that's the scoop. Anybody have any questions? I have a question. Um, do your block, do these block grants, are they ever applicable to um, the, the physical um, structure of, of the public housing buildings, South and NK Hill and NK Isle House? I mean, could you use monies to improve? Yes. You could. Uh, last year we did the kitchen at Grace House, which is uh -huh. what used to be Jesse's house down on West Street. Uh -huh. um, the Housing Authority has made many requests over the years smaller. They do depend on their modernization funds that they get from the state and feds. Um, the state, I'm trying to think which one is more generous. Um, but they, yeah, they have their, their own capital improvement programming and they manage themselves successfully enough that they usually do have some capital reserves, but every now and then they do come our way. It's certainly an eligible expense. And the money would have to be spent on something that lasts, right? You, you couldn't spend the money towards um, on maintenance or kind of ongoing expenses. Correct. It's got to be some kind of a capital project. Okay. Any further discussion or questions? Now, uh, can you comment on the reallocation of last year's funds? What, what, uh, it's always a moving target because program income consists of things like people paying back um, housing rehabilitation loans, home repair loans. Uh -huh. So it's not it, all coming from that Fed grant? It did initially, yeah. but once it gets out and circulating, sometimes it comes back. Um, there was a gentleman that owned a property on Locust Street, the Valley Inn, um, operated uh, DMH clients for a long time. He ended up pulling market rates, so he had to pay his loan back. So sometimes things cycle back in. And sometimes <coughs> projects just don't happen, even with the best of intentions. So they they are able to get rolled over. Do you expect that uh, the total fund for 850000 will be spent this year? Mm -hmm. I would think so. There's, uh, the timetables look good for everybody. I think uh, people are ready to roll. So yeah, we should be able to get that out the door. The, the idea is not to have it sitting. Yeah. That's always the idea. That's always the idea. <laughs> Thank you, Peg, for all the amazing work you do with less and less resources. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure and a challenge every day. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any new business? Motion to adjourn. Oh, I move. Motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed?